I am Kat Small, and um, I'm the co-founder co of Co-Liberation, and I also am a product designer at SoundCloud. I'm sorry, excuse me, you're blocking the <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Lingo Cat. <laughs> um, I'm Stacey Mulcahy. Um, I help out with Co-Liberation. Um, I am a developer. I work at Microsoft. Yeah, so what exactly is Co-Liberation? We are a community of female uh, game developers. We were founded in 2013 by Phoenix Perry. Um, we like to teach uh, like free game development workshops and classes, hold game jams, that kind of thing. And we are currently heavily supported by the NYU School of Engineering in Brooklyn. So this is an example of one of our free classes. The majority of our classes and workshops are jam-packed. Um, we do a lot of women-only classes. Um, and uh, people generally are like new or really excited about programming, but we also have a lot of other levels of experience as well. We aim to kind of just create a community where we can learn from each other and teach each other. So everyone can learn and everyone can teach. Yeah, we don't claim to know everything, but we do share what we know. Um, we encourage other people to do the same. So we aim to form a mesh, a mesh network where women can share information and support each other um, and then one day kind of move on without us and go off and do their own cool stuff. Um, so the gaming industry poorly represents women and marginalized people. Um, despite, despite the fact that a large number of women and people of color play video games, a lot of games aren't marketed toward them. Um, and having so many games in which uh, women and people of color are stereotyped and portrayed in stereotypical ways can have negative side effects. Well, we all know that you know game development means diversity. This is not a new topic, something that we've heard quite a bit about. And we've decided that this is something that we just want to stop necessarily talking about and start doing something about. We want to try to fix it. So uh, in terms of statistics, women overall make up about 25% of programmers, and that's actually down from 42% in 1987. So this is an article from Cosmopolitan Magazine in 1967 about the computer girls, um, which is actually sort of like a, a profession that people used to have. So this is a cool systems engineer sort of working with another, another engineer in the office. Um, so this just used to be women's work. That's pair of programming right there. Yes. <laughs> um, and so in terms of game development, um, in the 2014 uh, IGDA Developer Satisfaction Survey, 33% uh, of all responders identified as game developers. And in terms of gender, according to that same survey, women are 22% of the games industry workforce. Um, so statistically speaking, that means 7% overall of game developers are women. Um, so. That number is still a little frustrating. It's better than the 4% that it was before, um, but we don't feel like that's nearly enough. So instead of waiting for change, we just decided we wanted to try to leave our own. So this was our first class in the summer of 2013. Uh, one game development tool was taught that day. And if we look at the instructors and TAs, there are five people who are there who are in the instructors are helping out as a TA. We had you know three, 33 hours of instruction you know in C++ and you know 60 female attendees um, and so a great turnout in terms of our you know first event. It was ridiculously packed and we were really surprised and excited to see that many people, that many women who were actually interested in making games. And you know that was actually just the beginning. So now we're at, uh, we taught eight game development tools, including Game Maker, Processing, Open Frameworks, Phaser, and Unity. Um, we're up to like over 15 instructors and TAs at any given time. And we've taught over 190 hours of instruction across these different classes and workshops. And we've had over 800 female attendees across these workshops as well. And during that time, we've had two game jams, which you know usually are a weekend kind of event, or you know, more, more intensive. Yes. Yeah. Um, and we've also t uh, spoken at 13 different conferences. So how we usually run our classes is that we try to teach uh, in a fun, inclusive way that makes people feel excited about programming. So some of the ways that we try to do this are by teaching programming as a creative tool, but we try not to dumb it down because we don't think anyone's stupid. We just think they you know, need some time to figure out how programming works. 
Um, and we also try to be very open and understanding. Um, we don't say that any question is too dumb. I answer all questions in any of my workshops and everyone else does the same. Um, and then we also acknowledge when we make mistakes um, because we want to teach that everyone's human. I totally flubbed in the middle of class before um, and I just, you know, go back and like figure out how to change the code and make it work the right way. And people sort of get to see that and see that, you know, no one is a genius. Um, everyone um, has to sort of like figure out what they're doing and figure out how to get over those mistakes. So this is um, an example of one of the 48 hour game jams where uh, we had several women who would come together and they would join up in teams and over that time they would produce uh, games. So a lot of the women who came to these game jams actually learned to make uh, games for our workshops, but some of them also didn't. They already knew how to do game making. Um, and then at the end of each jam, uh, we get everyone together and they get to show off their work and then we also invite press um, so that they can actually get their names out there. Um, and we encourage those same women to keep working on their games uh, after the jam is over. We also hold events, um, sometimes uh, men, women, you know, it doesn't really matter, and, and we try to just, you know, do these things for the community to help build the community, rather than just keeping it, you know, silent somewhere else. So, I mean, we've learned a lot of lessons doing this, and, you know, some of them, you know, it's very small things, tactical things, and some of them have a bigger message, I, I guess you can say. So I guess the number one thing that we've learned is that you've got to stand up and be visible, and we, we know about this. But you know, you've got to speak about your work in the industry. If you're not doing this, you need to be doing this because people need to be able to look at you and say, I want to be like that person. I see myself, I can relate. And if we all have the same kind of person always talking about the same kind of thing, then you are totally narrowing that audience of people who can relate to you. So it's really important, it doesn't matter where you come from, where your background comes from, that we have this really diverse background so that people can are more drawn to the industry rather than keeping it silent. So one of the things, for example, that I like to do uh, as a member of Code Liberation and a game maker is actually go out to schools and talk to people at colleges. Um, and one time I went to York College, which is in the Bronx, and I'm actually from the Bronx, so uh, I went, I spoke to a game making class there and they were so happy to see someone that was from the Bronx that was a person of color just talking about the actual thing that they do, which is game development. Um, that it sort of like made them really happy and excited. So um, just sort of go out there and show your face and you know, you don't have to talk about your experience per se, you can talk about whatever you want as long as you are there and you say that you do what you do. Yeah, if you can't see it, you can't be it. And I think that's exactly like kind of what Kat was getting at is that, you know, you need to be able to, the best way that you can represent yourself or represent any of these kind of segments that we need to see in terms of diversity is probably to talk about your work. Talk, you know, talk, if you're a person in tech or you're a person at Game Maker, talk about game making and people will just look at you and everything else will just kind of make those connections. You know, you don't have to put forward that, you know, all these uh, modifiers necessarily. The other thing that's really important to note, or just that we learned, is that uh, women do want to make games, and they can. Um, they might not know how to do it yet, but like they'll get there. You just have to sort of like teach them how to do it. Yeah, I mean, there's a very sincere interest and in, in curiosity that you see, and and that's to us one of the most rewarding things. Now, a lot of um, women in our classes come from different backgrounds, which is really cool to find out as well. Um, so, for example, we've had a lot of people who are completely new to programming, which is really cool. Um, we've had uh, artists and designers who have experience working with programmers, but may not have actually done any or have sort of tinkered with it a little bit, but might have gotten frustrated. Um, we also have people who have like web development experience or some kind of external experience that's kind of relevant. And then we have, uh, we've also had some former computer science majors or like other majors related uh, to programming and they kind of had a bad experience where they might have dropped out or like felt negative. Um, so we kind of had to learn to deal with all these different kinds of people in each of our different classes. And one way we try to do this is by using real life examples. Um, so, for example, if I'm talking about uh, functions in a language, I might say that functions, like creating a function is like teaching a dog to fetch or like, you know, do a trick. Um, things like that, using analogies really help people to understand these like complex abstract concepts in a sort of like normal way that they can remember while they're using it later. 
basically for every 10 people, if you plan on having a workshop or you want to run something like this yourself, for every 10 people you need one teaching assistant. It's not because you're dealing with newbies who have no idea or you're dealing with experienced people or whatever. It's the fact that people just can get caught up on very simple things, a new IDE they don't know about, uh, momentary file management, maybe they're, you know, they've got uh, I am running up and you know getting a just, server running. getting a server running you know those little things and so having people who you know you might be teaching Unity for example and I might not know Unity but my ability to pay attention and just kind of watch people and, and come around and help them um, makes all the difference in that learning experience. And one of the other things we try to do is actually um, see people who have attended these classes before and then find them and say, hey, can you help this other person out? And sort of like get those people who have a little bit more experience, who know what's going on, who are kind of like, ah, why am I still waiting around for these people to finish, you know, figuring out this stuff. They can actually help other people, so you can kind of get like temporary TAs within your own class. People really like tinkering, and so we try to provide resources, slides, code after the fact. I mean, we want people to come into a class and learn something and to feel empowered. I mean, that's the most important thing. Come out of that feeling empowered that you can go and dabble with something and it's not scary, it's not any of that kind of stuff. But we don't want that to stop there. We want people to go on and feel confident enough that they can go and, and pursue that stuff. So by providing resources after the fact and mentorship and all that kind of good stuff where we support people afterwards, um, we hope that it doesn't you know, end at a, a three hour class and that it's just the start of something new for them. So ways that we share our resources is we have a repository of slides and code on GitHub. Um, and I actually went in um, and turned that repository into a GitHub page so that people who aren't very adept with uh, GitHub can actually go in and still download or look at all of our stuff. Um, but besides that, we also do uh, we write blog posts. So every time I write an email um, after the end of class saying, hey, here's all these cool things if you're interested in more tutorials or whatever the case may be, I also turn that into a blog post so that people who didn't go to the class can also get to see uh, a list of these resources. Um, and then again, as I said, I do email blasts, but we also do tweets every now and then. If we find something really cool, we try to share that on social media so that other people um, can see what, you know, what we're doing and what we're interested in. Um, one of the things that we've learned very quickly is that you got to space out classes and events so that you don't burn people out. It's not just about burning yourself out because this is like a volunteer thing. Everyone who's working with code liberation, they're going to school full time or they have a full time job and we're trying to figure out a way to do this in our spare time. So very quickly it becomes a balancing act for yourself, but it's also for a community because when you start working with the community, you have to be very, very uh, conscious about their needs, what, what, what's going on there, and not to burn them out. Not having something every week, not having workshops all week long and then a game jam at the end. Like, you have to kind of, you know, suss out your community and, and treat it the way that, you know, you would like to be treated or how, you know, the rest that you need. Yeah, and the timing is like super important. We found that out really quickly. Yeah, don't, don't do something like right before a major holiday. Or, you know, maybe there's like a hackathon going on that's got 400 attendees, maybe you don't want to do it then. Not a good idea. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's just, yeah, we've had that problem where it's just like, yeah, we put something right before a holiday, everyone's out like traveling somewhere or like, and if you do want to actually like do something before an industry event, maybe actually get in contact with them and say, hey, I'm really interested in doing this thing. Um, would you be interested in sort of like mentioning it or like building hype or can we possibly work together to kind of like get our communities in the same space? I mean, okay, politics, yeah. Politics. Politics, yay! <laughs> yeah, that's how I feel, politics, yay! But I mean, the reality is is that not everyone is ready to hear your message at the time that you're saying it and that sucks. It's like an album that you don't really know how to appreciate at a certain age, right? <laughs> like, Yola Tango for me. I was like 18 thinking it'd be cool, didn't understand it right now, I'm like, yes. <laughs> right? The same thing goes for the messages that you're trying to get across. Not everyone's ready for it at the right time. And so you have to be persistent. You have to knock on that door and you have to keep knocking. If someone doesn't want to listen to you, that's fine, you just keep knocking. Oh, I'm sorry, we got disconnected. And you just do that. Because if you don't do that, you let other people win, right? And so you need to keep doing that message and keep like just knocking down those doors because sooner or later, at some point in time, whether that person opens the door or someone comes up 
front of them and opens it for them, it's going to happen. And this has probably been the hardest thing because it's very, very discouraging. Incredibly discouraging when you start putting out things to proposals and like not, we're not gonna say any names, but you get continuously turned down for these proposals and you're really suggesting stuff that is obvious content that they need. You just gotta keep doing it. You gotta keep doing it. And you just gotta be like, I'm not going away. And so that's probably one of the hardest things. And, and you know, have a backup plan. You know, if you're proposing A and that person doesn't like your A, you have a B. Because your B is probably gonna meet them in a different perspective or a different way. And, and so you need to kind of have that backup plan and be flexible in that way. But just be persistent. Be that annoying little person. Yeah, and sometimes we even had to like negotiate a little bit, like for Pax Dev, for example. We, it didn't start, like we started with something we really liked and then we ended up with something we were kind of like, all right, we can totally do that. Um, and it ended up being really great and we met a lot of cool people, we got our names out there and like Co-Liberation had a thing in Seattle and it was really cool and people really liked it. Um, so sometimes even if like your first idea gets shot down, um, just keep trying. It's, it's really important to do that. Um, and then on that same note, community building takes work, so please don't be afraid to ask for help. Like, I ask a ton of our former students, for example, can you like, you know, can you come in and TA, or like, can you help us organize this game jam or this event? Um, and people are totally willing to do that because if they're a part of your community, they're going to be excited about that. Um, and even if they're not a part of that community yet, if you think someone's going to be interested in what you're working on, you should totally just reach out to them. Um, even if they say, you know, you know, that's okay too. Um, but the other great thing is that um, by having these people come in, you're sort of like building this network of support and mentorship. So you can sort of like connect people together and get them to like work on their own stuff. Um, or like they just kind of start building their skills and you get to sort of see that happen. It's cool. Yeah, and I think a really important thing that we have internally, uh, for sure, amongst co-liberation of people who do most of the organization or most of the work, is that we really, really believe and if you're getting lifted up, if you're having success, if, if that means PR or speaking or whatever, that you're lifting other people up with you. And so often when we're asked to speak at different events or hold workshops, it's not always the same person. It's going to be multiple people across the board because we don't believe in like pushing someone down to raise someone else up. We just, if you're getting raised up, you're taking everyone with you. Exactly. So we do still have a long way to go, even though you know the past year has been pretty awesome. Um, so the next couple of things that we're working on include a, an international network of game development classes for women. And that's because uh, right now we're mainly based in New York. As I mentioned earlier, we did something in Seattle. We've had a couple of other um, events. Uh, they're kind of like one-offs across the United States. Um, but now Phoenix, uh, who is the person who, co or who originally came up with the idea for Code Liberation, is now overseas. So, you know, we want to kind of figure out how can we bring Code Liberation across the United States for realsies, but also actually figure out something, you know, we want to make this bigger and get people across the world making games. Uh, we want to create like an easy kind of uh, to access set of online game development lessons. Um, you know, we want to kind of lead, I guess, in terms of, of, of you know, education for game development and things that we're doing that works and just make them something that someone else can use somewhere else if they need to and then start kind of that, that repo of um, really good content in that sense. Yeah, we don't want to be the only people like doing this. We want other people to be able to do it as well because we think it is awesome and worth it. And on that note, we also want to create a publishing platform for female creators so that um, women can sort of go out there and make their own games and earn that money and then maybe, you know, start helping other people as well. Yeah, we want to, we, I mean, we're basically looking right now at supporting um, female game developers and helping them get something out there. So, join our army. If you're interested, then we have a website, codeliberation.org. Uh, we have a mailing list on there where we announce our classes. Um, we also sometimes share job news, um, event information, cool stuff that's happening. Uh, we have a Twitter, which is at codeliberation, and you can contact us at hello at codeliberation.org if you're interested. Does anyone have any questions? Hi. Oh, you can go first. Oh, okay. Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, could you talk about some of the games that have come out and the kind of uh, discourse around gender and if any of those games you think they couldn't have existed without a program? 
Yeah, so there have been there have been a lot of really cool games from the game jams that we've done. Um, we're not sure of the status right now of some of them, but people have definitely continued working on them, and they're so cool. Um, I don't know how easily I can find examples on the internet right now, but I really want to do a Google search because we have press articles about it. Um, but we've had a lot of really cool people, like um, this one set of jammers included this name, this lady named Slada, who's at Google right now. Um, she's doing a lot of really cool stuff. Um, Fatima is also here. It's hard. If you're interested in talking about some of the things that you've done, would you like to come up here? And actually, we have two game, we have two collaboration people who should come up here. Yeah, yeah, really? yeah the both of you. Ding, ding. Yeah. Ding, 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 correct. Get up here. So they can actually kind of talk about like their experiences in the classes and what they've been working on in that. Would be cool with I like that you guys take the long way around. <laughs> like, oh, we're just gonna, we're gonna block this out. By the time I get there, you won't have any time. Yeah. On the spot. So, uh, my name is Fatima. Uh, I came to Co-Flagration in the first class, the Alpha C++ class, and it was really tough in a way because I felt like, and to me, oh, you're learning C++ and you're going to make games and consoles. I'm like, oh, all right, <laughs> how is this going to happen? But it worked out and I never had any programming experience before then. And that was the first time and it kind of like pushed me into computer science. So now, like next semester, I'm finally pursuing computer science in Columbia. And without like collaboration, I wouldn't be in this spot right now. And you have a game, you have a game out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I have a game um, that Stacy helped me publish. It's called Hellfire Nun. You're a nun in hell and you're shooting minions. <laughs> she comes to me, she's like, I have this game. I look, I was like, how do I not help you? <laughs> And so we got to learn a ton of different developer tools. We started out with Twine, we learned Phaser, we learned how to like make art in Photoshop for our games, how to make tile sets, how to make music. So it was like this really awesome sort of comprehensive look at like all these different tools that then got like put into our hands. And it was really fantastic. So I have a bunch of like half-finished Twine projects and stuff like that. I actually come from like an analog game design background. I make like freeform tabletop and LARP sorts of games, and so uh, Codeflip was really helpful to me because I'm also learning a program, kind of like unite those two things, like the two project areas in my life. And so it was just really fantastic and I got to meet a lot of awesome women from that. Thanks guys. Thank you. Yeah, so in terms of like, I believe you also asked about like gender discussion, if I remember correctly. So um, to be honest, usually like during our classes, we kind of just like zone into programming itself. Um, I would say like, yeah, I mean, we usually just focus on like making things and sometimes we might have like random talks, like we might randomly discuss it, but like, I don't know, we just kind of get in the zone and like just like start creating and like expressing ourselves. But um, I don't know if we really, I mean, like, I don't know, we've had, like, some conversations about gender, but, like, it's usually, like, we're more focused on, like, making things, I guess you could say, um, and one, that kind of unites us. I guess one thing that kind of does come back, though, is you do get people in classes who they want to connect with you after and have these discussions, so, you know, I, I sat, for example, my first example is I sat in a Unity class, and I was just, you know, helping out people, and I had um, one of the ladies beside me say, oh, can I email you? And, and next thing I know, I'm giving her career advice on, on how to negotiate a salary or things like that to worry about. So, uh, you know, that stuff happens, but it's not at the forefront of, I think, what we try to do. Yeah, it's definitely like after class stuff. Um, but sometimes it, don't, it totally does happen. Um, does anyone else have questions? I think we have like two minutes. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. 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 I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll follow up later. Yeah, cool. Thanks, guys. Thank you.